Hey guys, this is Commander Matthew, and before we start this episode of Trek Back Tuesday, I want to tell you about my Star Trek podcast. Trek Untold is a weekly interview series where we chat with character actors, stunt performers, writers, directors, and behind the scenes people who make the Star Trek universe go at warp speed. Our show is about putting the spotlight on folks who aren't normally in the spotlight. It's about the people who have contributed to Star Trek but aren't in the opening credits of the show. You might not know their names or recognize their faces at first, but I guarantee after you hear our discussions with them, you're going to never forget them again. If you're a fan of not only Star Trek history, but also cinema and television, as well as the entertainment industry and all sorts of other things, you're going to really enjoy hearing this podcast. We're not just discussing appearances on TV shows with these actors, we're discussing acting theory, or we're talking to prop makers and behind-the-scenes crew and discussing how things work that we don't ever see on camera. Each episode is a deep dive into the profession of what these folks do, and you're going to really enjoy hearing their stories. You can check it out on whatever Apple device you're using, whether it's a phone or a pad, or you can listen to it on your favorite Android device. If you want to learn more about Trek Untold, make sure to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And it's available on most major podcast platforms, including iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, and many more. Check us out this coming Thursday for our latest episode, and until then, fortune favors the bold. Hi, I'm Captain Andrea. I'm Commander Matthew. And welcome to Trek Back Tuesday. This is the show that explores time and space to seek out new and old Trek merchandise from across the galaxy. And today we are going pretty far back in time to the 80s. Today we're looking at Star Trek The Next Generation action figures. From Galoob. Yeah, so Galoob is an interesting company. They no longer <laughs> exist, sadly. But... Yeah, this is them doing the very first Star Trek The Next Generation articulated action figures. Well, what's funny about that is, you know, we, we just looked at recently the Mego action figures mm -hmm. from the first motion picture. After that, there was nothing for the second movie. Yeah. And the second movie did incredibly well. Basically, the first movie didn't do that well. So they assumed, let's not go with action figures. And then you got the second one and it did super well. So for the third one, they had action figures. Mm -hmm. Those were by Ertl and that movie didn't do good either. And no one cared about those toys. And then, so then came the fourth movie, which did really well and no toys again yeah so basically there the whole thing was the even number movies needed toys and there were none the odd number ones had toys and didn't need them but by the time you get to the fifth movie again they decided let's try toys one more time that's when they recruited Galoob for the very first time and we mm -hmm. actually reviewed one of those figures from that they yes. did pvc style statue figurines of some characters <laughs> from that movie and i guess that impressed them enough to continue working with them for this very first line of Star Trek TNG toys. That's fair. I mean, we, we enjoyed that. We enjoyed the figure. It was fine. Yeah, yeah, what they were was fine. I think that these figures are actually from roughly around the same time period, in fact. So mm -hmm. they're not too far apart from each other. Yeah, this is from 1988. Yeah, so I, I actually can't remember which one came first, to be honest. But they're still clustered fairly close yeah. to each other. And I mean, either way, they did enough of a good job that they decided to do figurines and articulated toys. So yeah, that's exciting. So taking a look at the front, it's kind of interesting artwork that they did. I like that they have the, you know, they have the characters' faces on there. I like that we have the ships. It's not as artistic as I would like. I mean, it's still really nice. The Migos had some, like, their art was pretty banging. I really liked that a lot. The Mego Star Trek figures, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I thought you meant Migos in general. Like, typically no. Mego boxes were just usually flat color, but the mm. TNG fig... Uh, but yeah, but the Star Trek motion picture toys, those had really amazing box art. Yeah. Yeah, this is a little blandish, but it does pop on a toy shelf, I'll still say, because oh, it yeah. is that bright blue, and it's got the Enterprise on it, which looks really good. Yeah, and I like that, you know, it's a very realistic look of their faces. Yeah, no, they did a good job on it. It's just not as dynamic. It wouldn't capture my attention as much as the Mego. What I find to be an interesting choice is that for the plastic that we see around the figures, isn't this like weird coffin shape? Oh yeah. It's a very bizarre, unique shape. I don't know why they went with that choice, why they did that shape. <laughs> well, I know why they did it for Tasha, but you know. <clears throat> Ouch. And on the back, you get to see who else is joining us in this wave, which includes the Ferengi leader. So you might notice that uh, there's only four figures on the table here. Today, we're only going to be looking at the Starfleet characters. We'll explain why in a little bit. But yeah, Series 1 supposedly includes the Ferengi. I'm actually not sure like if he was part of Series 1 yeah, or not. I'm a little iffy on that timeline. That's a little bit confusing because normally when you're putting a wave up, you don't include a random figure that isn't a part of it. Yeah, I'm a bit confused about how that all worked out timeline-wise, but he's there at least. Yeah, so you know you can get someone who's not, you know, regular Starfleet crew. So at least there's that you know you know you'll have a villain to play with yeah at some point because it's an evil ferengi leader not just a ferengi leader of course of course and we also get to see the phaser and the ship which was like a really small die cast metal ship that's mm. actually really nice looking i've seen the phaser a few times also it's also fairly small but it looks pretty good it's the type one phaser and each one has a really pretty good bio actually i'll admit the bios are pretty decent on these figures yeah i didn't even notice that and best of all they include proof of purchase mission points 
You know, that's part. That's what honestly what I was looking at, Commander Matthew. Do you know what the mission points will get you? Yes. What? Nothing. Pretty much. Nothing came from these toys, unfortunately, because they didn't quite last long enough. It wouldn't be that long until playmates took over the line. But yeah, the mission points didn't do much of anything. Nope. Once upon a time, you could have used those points to help get you some extra swag or get you into the fan club, but they gave up on that and they're just like, here, just write us. Yeah, I feel like there weren't many toy lines that really did that. Like, G.I. Joe, which were the ones that I feel like popularized it the most, yeah. and you got good stuff if you, if you did send in the mission points, but otherwise, a lot of folks had them, and a lot of toy lines just didn't last long enough to really ever have anything to cash in on them with. Oh well, we move on. We move on. Commander Matthew? I think we've wasted enough time talking about the packaging. Agreed. Let's beam these out. Hi, Captain. All members of the bridge crew are accounted for, Captain. They're not at all what I expected, and yet completely what I expected. <laughs> Does that make sense? I think I can understand a little bit what you mean, Captain. Maybe you should extrapolate further for our audience. From behind, they look very good. They actually look very nice. They're decent looking figures. There are some likeness issues that I'm sort of like, eh, about. But overall, they're not bad, especially for when it was, for who, it, which company it was with and everything. But at the same time, a few of these, oof, mm, yeah. oof. Some are definitely better than others. Mm -hmm. But I will say for the time period when these came out, and from this being based on the first season when reference material was pretty scant, yeah, I'd say they're not bad. I think they're actually pretty good. Yeah, I agree. I think my favorite, probably either Geordi or Worf. Yes. I'm gonna agree with you and I'm gonna go a step further and say one thing that I very much appreciate with these figures is how dark their skin is. Traditionally, it's an ongoing conversation in various corners of um, action figures, dolls, and you know, like all toy companies, you know, there's a whitewashing of sorts with black characters, black and brown characters in particular. And we've seen it on this series before. Yeah. In fact, we've looked at uh, two different versions of Commander and Captain Sisko, mm -hmm. where the earlier one was much, much lighter as opposed to a later one that was actually more accurate, darker skin tone. Yeah, and while I do feel like these might be a tiny bit too dark, I'd rather these be darker than lighter because you don't get figures like this very often and it's a, it's a yeah. gorgeous brown color so I would rather have that than have something lighter so big props to Galoob for that. Yeah the skin tones are pretty great uh, I have to also add that Worf's paint on his ridges too like yeah, they actually went out of the way to add more detail to the ridges that I really like. I like it but at the same time it stands out this is an example of maybe they could have used a slightly darker highlight color just because it's a little too bright for my tastes but and if you're gonna do edge highlighting on a mass-produced toy for the late 80s, for, I'll take that. Yeah, no, for, for what it is, it's not bad. Preference would have been a little bit darker, but it's all good. And quite frankly, this is way better than say this. <laughs> Data had a lot of problems, in case you couldn't tell. Mm -hmm. So Data was the figure in the series that had the most variants, not by choice. <laughs> So there's like, I think, three other versions of Data. There's the normal face Data. There's an actually a paler version of Data with more of a flesh tone face to him. Then there's mm. Speckled Data. There's a Data that count with little spots on his face. And then there's also a blue Speckled Data. I think, so I, I might be conflating the two of those together, but there's basically a lot of problems with Data that they couldn't get a skin tone right. They didn't yep. know he was an Android at first, I guess. Um, and then they said the random paint splotches because maybe they thought he was some other weird alien species with Pentapox. I don't know, but he had a lot of trouble. So this is arguably probably one of the worst data figures ever. Yep. But you know, the part that gets me, and I don't know, maybe it's me, but the part that's really just standing out to me, I really like the skin tone. It's it's not as pale as it possibly could be. And I get what they were trying to do, but those yellow lips are just a tad too yellow. It, it looks like he was making out with Big Bird. He might have been. Uh, yeah, I agree. The lips I never really liked either. I didn't understand why they were that color. But I guess, again, just edge highlighting. They're trying to make it pop a little bit more on, on the stand. That so I'll doesn't give look credit like. for trying, but that, it was a fail. Yeah, but that doesn't look like edge highlighting. That just looks like lipstick. Yeah. <laughs> that, that looks like something that was more of a choice. I think, like I said, I think the skin tone is a pretty decent skin tone. His nose and his face are a little too full to be Brent Spiner. But yeah, those lips. Oof. I think the Riker and Yar are also really good, though. 
they're, they're good. They're, they're, I mean, nice. they're, they're kind of all tied as like second best sculpts yeah. is, is Tasha, Riker, and, and the captain. I'll include in there as well. Patrick Stewart's face is not quite there. And I gotta say, Patrick Stewart kind of does have a difficult face to sculpt. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. He's all angled. He's got a difficult face to even draw. I mean, he's, he's, he's got a rough face. I feel like this might be my favorite of, you know, of the guys in terms of likenesses, maybe? I think they capture the best expression. Yeah. It really feels like him, even though the sculpt might not be 100% like him. Yeah, yeah. And it might, be just be, it might just be the paint job that actually kind of makes him worse, to be honest. I feel like if you just had the head without the paint job, without the eyes being as painted yeah. as they are, it might look a little bit better. I feel like Tasha and Riker, their faces are a little too small to be them. It's an interesting thing I noticed about these figures that these sculpts are very kind of elegant. That's like yeah. the first word that comes to mind when I look at these figures. It's not action-packed Star Trek toys. They're very elegant sculpts. Like the way their limbs are shaped, where their arms and bodies are sculpted. There's a lot of rounded edges. There's a lot of soft corners, soft mm -hmm. edges, and their features as well. Like they're sculpted and they're nicely done, but they're very almost doll-like in some ways. Yes, that yes, that's the word that I, that I was looking for. There's just something very soft about them. I mean, I could easily see this as being something that they sold as a doll. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. But surprised they didn't upscale these as they could have. I'm surprised they, they could didn't. have made so much money with Bar you know, in Barbie. If you look at Worf and Jordy, they look. Yeah, I feel like these two are the best. Yeah. These two are definitely the best in likeness and just overall. I, I mean, I love the sash. Yeah, it was one of my favorite things as a kid. The sash has so much detail. Oh my god, the texture of the sash is just fantastic. I would say, in terms of my, my rankings, it would be the men. Card, Riker, Yar, Dana. Yeah, fair enough, yeah. So in terms of accessories, well, you're kind of looking at them because they came packaged with their phasers in their hands, permanently sculpted onto them. Uh, basically, one hand is a fist, <laughs> the punch aliens, the other hand is a phaser. But you can't forget the biggest, most important accessory of them all. It's their little tricorder purse. Yeah, as a kid, this or confused me. <sighs> it looks more like a cell phone. It looks like a remote control almost. It was a... Oh, it looks wow. like an early cell phone. I wonder if any Star Trek fans have done that at conventions and have the, those as earrings to walk around with that. I would do that. Oh my god, that's a great idea. Bajoran earring, but with those. Ooh. Meta. If you guys know any, anyone who's done that, please sound off below. Give us links and everything. But yeah, so how do we put this on? That's what I can never figure out as a kid. Because like I would put them on their necks, but it looks Sorry, stupid Warf. on their necks. Like Because, yep. yeah, it looks <laughs> awful. I mean, there's this way. And it looks not much i mean it's better because it fits but it still looks pretty stupid mm, and if you move depending on who it's on it goes down to the crook of their arm and it looks even stupider yeah so this was a bad design choice uh, i mean it's i guess they had to find a way to include the accessory and it's nice that they did it's just a terrible choice it's just worthless and absolutely pointless because mm -hmm. you can't the figures can't even interact with it yeah, as it a child good. you can't interact with it either because it's just that yeah, what's the point yeah really it, it is it's, it's just what's the point with that so that's why that accessory is going to go back to where it was which the was the bowels of hell waste containment unit works for me one thing we have to talk about of course is the paint job so we mentioned that data had all sorts of crazy inconsistencies yeah. uh you know the paint quality in general was also up and down because i feel like the bodies were always very clean it's just the faces and more so not with uh jordy and Worf, but with the more caucasian colored characters that they, they'd be the ones that have more soft on their faces you can see Riker's got a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm going to assume this is just wear and tear and age, but there's definitely some funkiness amongst the paint. Like there's one spot that looks as though it was rubbed off, but it, on data over here, it looks as that doesn't look like wear and tear. That looks almost as though someone put a finger in it, like the tip of their finger in it. Yeah. Um, there are a couple of smudges here and there where I think age did get the best of it and it just started wearing down, but I also think that it was a little funky. But overall, the uniforms, they came across really well. Yeah. I mean, they even painted in the badges. The pips are painted separately. Yeah. Uh, the most problem you'll see, oddly enough, is with the bigger accessory, like on the phaser. On oh all the, God. yeah, like on Picard and on Riker, I think, and I think probably Tasha as well. Like the, not the skin paint. Yeah, not on, not on Jordy and Worf, oddly enough. The skin tone on the white characters bleeds onto the phaser almost every time. Not with Jordy and Worf. So are we saying that this, that Gloob took better care of their black characters? Apparently so. That's awesome. Yeah, who knew? But otherwise, that's pretty decent. Yeah, no, no that's... Not, not too many horrible complaints for those. Also, I guess something that we had noticed before, I mean, are they somewhat in scale? They're in different scales. They're, they're in scale yeah. together. They're, they're different sizes. Yeah, because Jordy's a little shorter than Riker. Worf looks a little taller than everybody else. Yeah, everybody's kind of actually different sizes. So that's I, a little nice too. Nice yeah. detail. Wow. Oh man, I, I'm a little sad Galoob didn't have more time with these. 
Well, they kind of sort of did. They had the second series, which was all the aliens, uh, as well as Q. We got a Q figure. Yeah, but that's it, isn't it? Well, we were supposed to get two other characters with that. There was supposed to have been a Wesley Crusher mm -hmm. and a Romulan, and both those were canceled. That makes me sad. And they went as far as the proto face. There actually are protos out there of them. You can see what they looked like, fully painted protos. So they are out there, but you could never get them. Besides that, we also did get two vehicles that fit the figures. We got a Ferengi ship as well as the shuttlecraft, okay. which is a really nice looking shuttlecraft. Both are actually really great looking ships. And so on the note of what else Galoob did with this line, there was plans for this to go much bigger, much further beyond what they did here. And unfortunately, uh, I guess sales weren't good enough that they didn't continue. We were supposed to have gotten a bunch of playsets that were essentially like almost cardboard playsets. Yeah. So kind of a throwback to older toys as well. So more affordable playsets of like the Frangi planet and uh, different rooms. They had an engineering room. They're just basically all cardboard cutouts. But the playset we got robbed of, that would have been the best thing ever. And there was prototypes of this. There actually was an Enterprise that was in scale with the figures. Oh, that hurt. So basically you would pop the lid off the top of the ship and you could put them all on yeah. the bridge. So it basically would be like bigger than what we have here on our display stand with the full size ship as well around it. It would have been enormous, it would have been super expensive, but you know what, it would have been the 80s and it still would have been doable. It would have been worth it. Yeah, yeah and it would have, it, that would have been like one of the best toys ever and it didn't happen. Oh, that, that's really depressing. I, I feel like a lot of what's happened with Star Trek in particular, because we've, we've given all the stuff that we've looked at over time, I feel like Star Trek in particular is one of those franchises that really did get screwed out of some great products simply because of when they were scheduled to come out. Like these Galoob figures, I think with a little bit more time and another wa few waves, I think they really would have refined what they were doing and it would have been so much better. Clearly it didn't happen. And what was it we were looking at? Some of the diamond figures? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just, you know, the yeah. year was all slated to come out. It was a horrible year for Trek. And I just find it interesting to find out, to see just how much Trek suffered because of some of that, some of the Trek merch. And I think this suffered because they were also overproduced as well, mm -hmm. which is why then later on the Playmates did their run, they were yeah. doing the whole limited edition thing. Star Trek toys are all, all over the place. That's a whole yeah. other discussion for kind of, I would say, the abuse of the Trekkie fans. Oh yeah. Um, but that's a whole other video. <laughs> so something else I want to note about these figures is the articulation. These are three and three quarter inch figures, but they're actually pretty jam packed with articulation for the era. Yes. So let's keep in mind G.I. Joe's at this point are now out and those have crazy good articulation. <laughs> yeah. So the average three and three quarter figure doesn't quite hold up. With Galoop, they actually try to be a little bit more adventurous here. So we have the usual up and down shoulder joint. We have the legs that bend, but we have a knee joint, which is new. And they can get in some actually pretty decent poses here. You can get them kneeling and stuff. Um, but they also have ball jointed necks. They're, well, Jordy here is a little bit stiff, but their necks with enough wiggling around, they're actually ball jointed. They can get some like circular poses on them. Yeah. Unexpected little bonus. And just for the sake of comparison, because we just reviewed them last time, yes. I want to bring out the Mego three and three quarter inch figures from the motion picture. So here is Kirk and Spock. I guess we can show them next to uh, Riker and Picard. <laughs> oh, actually, Spock, if you put him up against Tasha, yeah. she's a little bit taller. Let's let's check them out against. Yeah, these actually they look all a little bit smaller. In fact, so they're slightly Ooh. smaller. Ooh. Yeah. Compared to War. Oof. So the Migos are slightly smaller, but you can see what I mean, less articulation. The poses are way more neutral with the old Migo mm -hmm. style figures. Uh, unfortunately, of course, Riker's in permanent punch pose and permanent phaser pew pew pose. But, um, you know, some interesting changes, some, some good choices. I think they're actually overall good choices. But I think part of why the line didn't continue that much is because of the limited range of what they could do with the bent punchy hand and the phaser permanently in their sculpted arms. So. Yeah. I just wonder if, given enough time, they would have maybe thought to put articulation in the elbow joint. Possibly. Could yeah. have happened, yeah. And that was our look at the Galoob Star Trek The Next Generation figures. I'm Captain Andrea. I'm Commander Matthew. And until next time, live long and buy toys.